Coca and I spent the last 10 minutes figuring out the right word of the day today because there's so many possibilities because of what's happening in the NFL with David Tepper and the Carolina Panthers. And here's where Coca landed, and I love it, except I never heard of it. Carolina Reaper, word of the day. Today is Tuesday, November 28th, 2023. Carolina Reaper is a triple entendre today. That's how clever Coca is. I wish that we had a camera on. Maybe we'll do that for our most loyal, nothing personal fans, is we'll let them into the live show a few minutes early one day and just see how we prep, what we're talking about, and then watch the final frenzy as we're tinkering with the potential word of the day. And then the way Coca gets inspired, I don't know if it's a Sharon Stone type muse or Albert Brooks or what he does, but every once in a while, and I don't mean rarely, I mean a couple times a week, he'll have this epiphany and I like it because the night before I'll send the word of the day or the afternoon before, what I think the word of the day should be. And then he'll decide, no, maybe this topic or that topic, or how about this, how about that? I was ready to go at 7.56 with Panther as my word of the day, talking about the animal, the Panther. And Coca said, no, no. How about David Tepper's Ring of Fire? Get it? Your hot sauce show? Hoop burn, rim burn, fire, pepper. Wait a minute. And then I'm watching his brain go. Carolina Reaper, which is the hottest of the hot peppers, which is what people are saying is what it is to be the coach of the Carolina Panthers. Yesterday's show, we covered the Carolina Panthers again. We thank David Tepper for all of his content. We said he's probably not on the Mount Rushmore, but he's getting there. We examined Frank Reich's press conference, some of his quotes, and then we stopped at 8.45. And at 9.15, ding, ding, that's my t text alert, it's Coca. And Frank Reich was fired. Let me make sure that I understand how significant this is. Frank Reich was fired by the Colts about 380 days ago. He was then hired by the Carolina Panthers to take over that team in a very, very popular hiring. Very, very good head coach. Tepper said, this is the start of a new era. My view is that all of the firings I've done, I found my guy. He gave him a long-term deal, tens of millions of dollars, then they lost a game, and then a game, and then a game, and then a game, and then a game. They're now one in 10 in Frank Reich's first season as coach. It's only been 11 games. Who would hire a manager to a long-term deal and fire them in their first season? Who would ever do that? At least wait till after the first season. That's what I used to do. Sign a guy to a three-year deal or a four-year deal and then fire him after one season. It makes you look like you're incompetent, like a fool. On the other hand, you can say to yourself, hold on, I'm not doubling down on my mistakes. I'm going to take the bull by the horn and I'm gonna to admit to the world to the detriment of my own Q rating that my hiring was bad. I was always willing to do that. It was a trade that made sense to me. We told you what David Tepper's record is since he took over as owner in 2018, the number of coaches he's gone through. He is now going to hire his seventh head coach, his seventh head coach. This makes my term with the Marlins look like the bastion of consistency. Let's dig a little deeper. What is it about the NFL versus MLB that would cause me to tell you that firing a head coach in football is a far bigger deal than firing a manager in baseball? And that is because it is my opinion that coaches in the NFL are more highly and directly correlated to winning in the NFL than managers are in baseball. It's not to say that managers aren't important. It's meant more to say that managers are more often scapegoats 
than they are reasons for winning. Now, of course, Bruce Bochy takes over Texas and Texas wins the World Series. Query, could Ron Washington have been the manager of that team and won the World Series? Did Bruce Bochy do something in the clubhouse that made Garcia Garcia and Simeon Simeon, et cetera, et cetera? I'm not sure. What I am sure about is that in the NFL, when you put your playbook together, whether you're calling offense or not, whether you're calling the defense or not, the head coach is responsible for a script. And people joke about the NFL being scripted. It's not. But what is scripted are games and game plans. In baseball, we tell you we have a game plan, an approach against a certain pitcher. We're going to spit on the spin and we're going to sit on the speed. That can be an approach. Or we're going to go opposite field. We can have a hitting approach. We can have a pitching approach that we try to talk to our players about. In the NFL, it's highly different. Not only do you have an approach against a team, you have a scripted set of plays that you run to start a game. You have certain things that you've set up over the course of a season. Bill Belichick was famous for that, where he would have certain formations that he knew were gonna be scouted by other teams. And he would go into that formation and then run a play, go into that formation, run a play, make it totally consistent. And then week 16, go into that formation. The other team rightfully so expects there to be a certain play. And then boom, he runs a different play when he needs it, touchdown. He had Tom Brady, but touchdown, Super Bowl, etc. In baseball, we don't say, all right, we're gonna pretend that we sit on the speed and spit on the spin. And then in the sixth inning, we're gonna totally change our mind and that'll really throw them off. It just doesn't work that way. So I've always had great respect for NFL coaches and I've always thought about how I would react to losing and how quickly I would go to firing. Cause in baseball, I would go there in lightning speed. What about Frank Reich's performance as coach changed in these 11 games? What did David Tepper learn about Frank Reich that he didn't know? That can be something that happens when you hire somebody from another team and you don't know them to live with them. That's like trading for a player. Oh, I thought he was good in the clubhouse and turns out he's a total turd. Or, oh, I thought he had a hard work ethic and a good work ethic, turns out he doesn't do anything. Could that be the same with Frank Reich or a head coach that you bring in, highly recommended, highly successful, and then, wow, he doesn't sleep on his couch, or wow, he doesn't have a game plan, or wow, he doesn't command the clubhouse. I guess that's possible. But then did it only come to light because he's one in 10? At 10 and one, all those issues go away because then you play the results. At one in 10, don't you play to what your plan was when you hired the coach? David Tepper gave a statement about this firing that was spectacular and he signed it. So let me give David some credit because sometimes it comes out through the spokesperson. We've seen that. Sometimes it comes out through the president, through the GM, sometimes just from the team unsigned. His statement was signed by David Tepper. And it said, I met with coach Reich this morning and informed him that he will not continue as head coach of the Carolina Panthers. I wonder how that meeting went. My firing meetings are pretty quick. Call the manager and say, hey, uh, we're gonna make a change. We feel as though now's the right time. We're not getting what we wanted and we thank you very much. Key card, please. You don't say much, they don't last long. So I'm wondering whether Tepper called Frank into his office and Frank said, wow, am I getting fired in my first season? And then what you don't see is Frank Reich walking out of the office, doing the Snoopy dance, removing himself from the Panthers, removing himself from Tepper because all of the other GMs who hire coaches and all the other owners who hire coaches look at David Tepper as someone who is not an evaluator of talent, someone who does not have credibility when it comes to hiring. So Frank Reich, this is not his last job in the NFL. This is guilt by association. You made a bad decision by going to Carolina. 
why would you want to work with Tepper? Which has caused all sorts of people to think, who the hell is going to want to coach this team? And Coke and I were talking about this before the show started, and we said that everyone's got it wrong. Every single person in the NFL or college, any coordinator, any head coach in college, frankly, 20 of the 32 head coaches in the NFL, they want to work for Carolina. Because what Tepper is proving is that he'll hire you, pay you tens of millions of dollars, and then fire you and you get paid not to work. You may have to mitigate, you may have to arbitrate, but you're getting paid. So David P Tepper informed Coach Reich that he will not continue as head coach. Here's where the statement lost me. Second sentence. What would be the second sentence when you fire your coach after 11 games in his first season and all you do is fire coaches and you start with, I met with him and informed him he would not continue as head coach. What would be your perfect second sentence? I have one. I take full responsibility for our failures on the field. I take full responsibility for my inability to hire a head coach. I am getting back to work right now, and I promise the fans of Carolina that I will be better. How about some accountability? Here was his second sentence. I want to thank Frank for his dedication and service, and we wish him well. What? Who wrote this statement? That's where you go to? What dedication and service are you talking about? The 11 games? I feel like maybe that's something that you say when you've coached for four years out of a five-year deal, or four years out of a six-year deal, or two years out of a three-year deal. One year out of a four-year deal? Frank didn't even get that. He got 11 games. There are 17 games. 11 out of 17. That's all he did. That's barely more than half of one season. Dedication and service? What, he show up to work every day? Way to go. And then he went to effective immediately. Thank God. I'm not sure why you put that in, in any statement. When you fire somebody, somebody's replacing that person. There's going to be a head coach. It's like when, when a pitcher gets injured and we'd be asked, um, who's going to be in your rotation now that this guy's out of your rotation? And our... Our PR people would say to me, just don't say effective immediately, this guy's going to start or this guy's going to play. Somebody's got to start. Somebody's got to coach, but it's in the statement anyway, effective immediately. Special teams coordinator Chris Tabor will serve as our interim head coach. Hmm. Interim head coach. That means that he's got seven games. That's it. Well, 11, 17, six games. Six games, seven weeks to be the coach, and then he will be let go. What struck me, in addition in this whole scenario, is that this interim seven game, eight week coach, the special teams coordinator, upon being named interim coach, fired two of the coaches who are working under Frank. In baseball, when you fire a manager, nine times out of 10, you fire the bench coach. Nine and a half times out of 10, because the manager chooses the bench coach. Sometimes the bench coach will stay, sometimes. Like Joey Espada survived some managerial changes in Houston, but he may not have been the bench coach the whole time except under Baker. But in any case, he's now the manager of the Astros. But my point is, Generally, you give the manager that one. You don't give him pitching coach or hitting coach. You don't give him third base coach. We made that mistake and gave Girardi the outfield coach, the infield coach, the bullpen coach, the catching coach. We gave his son a bottle. I mean, it was just insane. But generally, you don't do that. Bench coach, no problem. Do you know when we, side note, Coca, we hired Dan Jennings, that crazy thing we did when we made our GM the manager, and we let him choose his bench coach. Yes, we did. And I'd never met him, never heard of him. But Dan said, if I'm going to manage, I need this guy as my bench coach. And our view was, all right, you can have him. 
But for an interim coach to go ahead and fire two people off the staff, which he did, and they made very clear in their statement that it was not David Tepper doing this. It was the interim head coach. They got rid of their running backs coach and their quarterbacks coach. As though the head coach, the quarterbacks coach, the running backs coach, that's the reason why the offense produced 15 or fewer points for five straight weeks and seven times in 11 games. Fire them all. But why do you ask the interim head coach to fire the latter two? If you're David Tepper, the owner, and you're unhappy with your one and 10 record, you're unhappy with your offense, why can't you stand up and be a man and fire all three? I don't agree with asking your interim head coach to be the one who fires those guys. It's totally wrong. One of the things about accountability, it's so important when you're a leader, it's so important to be accountable. It's so important to be there when things are going badly in addition to when things are going well. People notice that. Accountability is so important in any industry because that is the currency. While we say it's business, and it is, and we say it's based on dollars and cents, which it is, part of getting people to give you money, whether you are a ticket holder, whether you are a reader of a magazine, whether you are a purchaser of a product, is the belief in the brand, the belief in the quality of the product, and in the belief that you are getting what you bargained for when you agreed to pay for the service. There is a major story going on right now in the world, and it comes out of a group that you've never heard of called the Arena Group. The Arena Group owns Sports Illustrated. I have a very deep emotional attachment to Sports Illustrated. My first subscription to any magazine in my name, other than what I saw at the barbershop, which of course is one of the great memories of childhood, and if you know, you know, was Sports Illustrated for kids. And I remember feeling like a man when at my bar mitzvah, one of my bar mitzvah presents, is that I graduated from Sports Illustrated for kids to the actual Sports Illustrated. That magazine being on the cover of Sports Illustrated was everything. When we decorated Marlins Park, if you go to the press box level right now at Marlins Park, although, it may be gone now, but originally there were paintings framed of every time a Marlin appeared on the cover of Sports Illustrated or any magazine for that matter, but Sports Illustrated was the big one. I remember the Jose Reyes, Ozzie Guillen Sports Illustrated cover going into 2012. My, how great those days were. Dontrell Willis on the cover of SI as part of a climate change article. Sports Illustrated used to mean so much in terms of credibility of its authors, its stories, its content. You felt smarter when you read it. You were excited for the last story, for the big story. What order did they do the stories? The SI mailbag, all of it. Yesterday was a day I won't soon forget. When there, an article came out in something called Futurism, which I had never heard of, and I actually sent it to Coco wondering whether it was real, what the story was. And this article claimed that Sports Illustrated used artificial intelligence, AI, to generate not just articles, but also authors and bios of those authors which means that you may have been reading an article that was not written by a human being, which means you may have written, read an article that not only was not written by a human being, but you were being tricked into thinking it was written by a human being because there was even a picture of the author that looked like a picture, felt like a picture. You'd have no reason to think it was anything other than a picture. There's even a bio. The man writing this article about outdoor sports and fishing has been an avid fisherman for 10 years and has written articles for 20 years on the subject. There's a comfort of knowing that. Why do you think when you read a book, everyone looks at about the author? 
other titles by this author. You build up brand equity. Sports Illustrated spent decades building up brand equity and it got flushed down the toilet yesterday, which meant once the article came out, I knew exactly what was happening. And so did you as a nothing personal aficionado, you knew what was happening. Who do you think was the first call? The arena group executives called their crisis PR team. And they said, this story has legs. We have to respond. And so they did. And they responded with something very bizarre to say the least. And I wanna go through it with you if you don't mind. I'm getting it right here, Coca. The actual response. Today, an article was published alleging that Sports Illustrated published AI-generated articles. According to our initial investigation, that must be very quick, the article just came out, it must be very initial, like after 10 minutes. This is not accurate. Whew, thank God. That was a big investigation by Samson and Coca Law. Thank God it's not accurate. But then they told you why. And this is when you have a problem when you make an announcement after only an initial investigation. You open yourself up to the very real possibility that you haven't done the full investigation and there may be some stuff going on that you knew about, but you're pretending to cover up or that you didn't know about it, which is even worse. The articles in question were product reviews and were licensed content from an external third-party company, Advon Commerce. Ding, ding, ding. You think Advon Commerce is not on the phone with its PR people? A number of Advon's e-commerce articles ran on certain arena websites. That's the group that owns SI. We continually monitor our partners and we're in the midst of a review when these allegations were raised. It's always funny, isn't it? When something goes wrong in your company and it's brought to your attention, you say, oh, oh no, we knew that. We were investigating it. We were looking into it. We just weren't ready with what was going on. So we didn't say that we were investigating it. But now that it's public, we have to come to the conclusion that it's not accurate, but we have to say it's only after the initial investigation. However, we were already looking into it when the article came out. Well, which is it? I guess the PR people were too busy getting it out quickly that they didn't realize that those two things likely can't exist in the same multiverse. Advon has assured us that all of the articles in question were written and edited by humans. It's human beings, but I digress. According to Advon, their writers, editors, and researchers create and curate content and follow a policy that involves using both counter plagiarism and counter AI software. So that means it's not AI. That means these people are real, except they're not. Then, Sports Illustrated continued, we learned that Advon had writers use a pen or pseudoname in certain articles to protect author privacy. Let me get this straight. When you're writing an article about fishing or about other such outdoor sports, you wanna make sure that you're in the witness protection system. You got to do it under a pseudonym, like you're checking into a hotel as a superstar because God forbid people know where you're staying and they call your room and wake you up in the middle of the night before a big game or a big case if you're a famous lawyer. Hi, I'm Jay Trotter. It's absurd. So far in these six lines, we've got four examples of complete horse hockey, but they didn't stop because what they would said Sports Illustrated, the arena group, that using pseudonyms, those are actions we strongly condemn. And we are removing the content while our internal investigation continues and have ended the partnership. Hell yeah. So let me get this straight. You've only done the initial investigation, but you've already fired the people who are doing what you say they've done, but you had no idea that it was being done, but now you're aware of it. But you were in the middle of looking into it prior to Futurism's article coming out. What? 
does this pass the smell test to you? Because it sure as heck fire doesn't to me. And it doesn't to the human beings working in Sports Illustrated either. Because the union Sports Illustrated writers, they had their own statement. We, the workers of the SI union, are horrified by a story on the site Futurism, reporting that SI's parent company, the Arena Group, has published AI-generated content under SI's brand with fabricated bylines and writer profiles. If true, these practices violate everything we believe in about journalism. We deplore being associated with something so disrespectful to our readers. And that was their whole statement. Now that's a really good statement written by writers. Because they say if true, because there's a chance it's not true. And then what they say is deplorable is not the use of AI, it's the line about it. I'm not here to tell you that I'm scared of AI or that I think AI is going to be a detriment to our society or that chat GPT is REM in Michael Stipe's view as the end of the world as we know it. I'm here to say that like social media and like so many other things in this world, including all photographs, given what I can do on my iPhone and I am iPhone illiterate. I can take a picture and make it look like I'm somewhere totally different. David, that's called Photoshop. I'm telling you, I don't know how to Photoshop, but there are ways to Photoshop. And I thought it was just filters to make people look better than they look. And then you meet them and you're like, wow, that doesn't look like your Instagram photos. And I realized that it takes 20 minutes to do an Instagram photo and I'm a one take, send it as is. Coca calls me and says, are you aware that your undies are showing? I mean, he hasn't said that, but that's an example of something that whatever, that's the photo I took. AI, if it leads to greater efficiency and it can help answer questions or write thank you letters or help with research or help make me better at what I do, I'm in. But you as the listener, as the consumer, and I'm a consumer just like you are, just not of nothing personal. I'm a provider of nothing personal, you're a consumer. How would you feel if every day at 8 a.m. you tuned in live on Nothing Personal with David Sampson YouTube channel? And this isn't me. This is some sort of hologram of me. I'm not actually here saying these things. This was totally AI generated. This was totally AI generated. This was totally AI. I think that's how Millie Vanilli got caught. Didn't their, didn't their lip syncing tape like get stuck one time and they were at a concert? Girl, you know it's true. Girl, you know it's true. Well, that's not part of the song. Girl, you know it's true. <laughs> I shouldn't be laughing at this. This is a big story. You're gonna hear more about this story and here's why. Because the arena group is gonna have to finish its initial investigation and they're gonna have to fire somebody. If it's someone who hired this ad Von group, if it's the editor in chief, whoever it is, this story doesn't end today. The union doesn't just have this statement. The entire writing community, the entire magazine purchasing article reading world does not just let this go because this is an inflection point. We need to know as readers, what are we reading? Go back to the SAG after strike which is being voted on next week, whether or not the strike will end and they'll accept the new terms. The writer's strike that ended and, was, and, and that was voted, the new CBA is done. One of the big issues was AI. Because if studios can use AI, there aren't any HR issues. There's no future rights issues. If you have an AI writer, an AI actor, that's it. You don't get a percentage of the gross, you're a robot. Would you want to know going into a movie, what's what and who's who? Is that really Julia Roberts? Or is it just a hologram of Julia Roberts? I'm going to give you an official wait to see here, Coca. Wait to see. The arena group fires somebody. And you can book it. All right, we come back. We're going to review another movie 
that just is available for purchase, I've now seen Oppenheimer. And it fits perfectly with our previous story because sometimes technological advances may be a detriment to life. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Nothing Personal. It's David Sampson on Tuesday morning coming to you live. And this is David Sampson coming to you on a Tuesday morning, coming to you live. Thank you for rating, reviewing, subscribing. Please do that. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you. I got uh, over a dozen new pictures yesterday. And not all of you send pictures, obviously. But when you do, I love it. Some I love the father's son. I love, I, I got a honeymoon picture, Coca. A guy and a, a man and a woman on their honeymoon were wearing matching, nothing personal stuff. So thank you for that. All right, I saw Oppenheimer. And, uh, oh, by the way, I may have uh, told you yesterday that I will not be live tomorrow morning, but I was incorrect. I will be live tomorrow morning because it's Wednesday. I'm live Wednesday, 8 a.m. Tune in. So Oppenheimer is now available. I didn't see it in the theater. This is a double Christopher Nolan week. I just realized. I don't think I've done that before. I'm reviewing Christopher Nolan's new movie, Oppenheimer, today. And Thursday, I'm reviewing movie number 73 or 71 of my top 100, where we review, I'm gonna start reviewing, or this is my third week already, where I randomly pick a movie for my top 100 and then review it, and I watch it again. So I watched Inception, since last Thursday, again, and I'm reviewing that Thursday. And I watched Oppenheimer, it became available for purchase on your streaming service. And of course, it's gonna be there come Academy Award nominations, come Academy Awards, so I needed to see it, wanted to see it. And here's where it gets dicey. Because part of our show is that I'm completely honest with you. I didn't know much about Oppenheimer before I watched the movie spent time researching or understanding what happened with the bomb, the Manhattan Project. I'd seen movies and I'd read articles. I'd never read a book about it. Didn't really talk about it much in history class that I can remember. I may have missed those classes or been watching Half Baked instead. And I didn't realize sort of the background of Oppenheimer. I didn't realize what happened to him while he was developing the bomb. I didn't realize what happened after he developed the bomb. I didn't realize what his point of view was and how it changed during the course of developing and then having Truman actually drop the bomb. Truman played by Gary Oldman in this movie. The problem I had with Oppenheimer, and it's not Cillian Jacobs. Cillian Murphy, excuse me. Is it Cillian Murphy, Coca? Who's Cillian Jacobs? Oh, is she the star of Love, that TV show that I love? In any case, he was in Inception 2 and he's the star, he plays Oppenheimer. And Killian, excuse me, I said Cillian. Killian, thank you, Coca. I'm so sorry about names. It makes Coca crazy. I mean, we've been together f since October of 19. This is episode 940. We're well over a thousand with sit downs and mailbags, et cetera. And we talk every day. I speak to him more than I speak to anyone in my life. And he can't understand what it is with me and names and neither can I. I apologize, especially because I have such a thing about my own name and people who misspell it, Killian Murphy. The reason that I didn't love Oppenheimer the way I wanted to is A, the hype of Oppie and Barbie and people who watch the double feature. I liked Barbie more than Oppenheimer, by the way. I thought that Killian's performance was fantastic. There were times I couldn't understand what anyone was saying and I should have put subtitles on and I didn't. But I thought that it was too big a vanity project for Christopher Nolan. Like trying too hard to be Christopher Nolan. What makes Christopher Nolan one of the greatest filmmakers of my life is when he was just making great movies and he wasn't trying to be or beat Christopher Nolan of yesteryear. When you try to live up to who you are, what you are, what you've been and what people expect, all of a sudden the quality can change because it's in your head. It's almost like playing not to get hurt and that's how you get hurt. 
I feel like Christopher Nolan went too far in Oppenheimer, unnecessarily. I found that it dragged. It's a three hour running time. I watched it in increments as though it were a limited series. I think I watched it over three sittings. I couldn't sit there for a full sitting, whereas Inception was like two and a half hours. I didn't move. I didn't look at my phone. We'll talk more about that on Thursday. So I guess what I would say to you is you have to see Oppenheimer because it's important to know about that part of our history that's 80 years old. It's important to understand what was going on, what the frame of reference was, the importance of what it means to drop an atomic bomb, what it is to develop an H-bomb, what it is in a world, in a global economy that some people can say is hanging on by a thread. What is it to have someone have something you don't? How important is it that either no one has it or that everybody has it? Is it the same thing? These are all things that you'll think about when you watch Oppenheimer, and I would suggest that you do. There is zero segue to our next topic, other than music. You know what I want? <laughs> I want to talk to Samson. So you want to talk to Samson. Thank you. Get on my Twitter, David P. Samson. You can follow, we have fun on Twitter. You can also go to davidsampsonpodcast.com and get your Cyber Tuesday merch. Hi, it's Hanukkah time, almost Christmas time. Or you can ask me a question and I may answer on the show. I try to respond to as many as I can, too many, which is, I'm thankful, you have no idea. You have no idea how depressing it is when you can answer every single question or DM. Not depressing, it just means you're starting out. I actually would not depressing. That's the wrong word. Ready? 4869. I loved that I was once upon a time able to answer everybody's questions and everybody's DMs. And it became an obsession where I would really try to respond to everything. It's just impossible now. David, I am one of your biggest fans in St. Louis. Ooh, that narrows it down to three people I know. But this is actually from someone I don't know in St. Louis but I, there must be one degree of separation to the people I do know and love in St. Louis. I'm gonna read that again because that sentence felt good. David, I'm one of your biggest fans in St. Louis. You happy with all the signings they've made so far? Seems like their pitching will be so much better and they should win the Central, right? Well, thank you for asking. And unfortunately, you're not right. And I'm sorry to Cardinal fans out there and I know there are a lot of you listening but you gave Sonny Gray $75 million yesterday. $25 million a year for three years for Sonny Gray. Yes, an unbelievable season last year, no doubt about it. A rotation completely redone because of your great lineup with Goldschmidt and Arenado. Sonny Gray is your one, Miles Mikolas is your two. You brought in Lance Lynn as your three. Lance Lynn, he's a seven. Steven Matz, you signed to a four-year deal. Congrats, spending money. He's an eight, but he's your number four. But you brought in Kyle Gibson as your five. He's a 12. John Maziliak, your president of baseball operations, wants you to believe that you now have depth, that your team is way better today than it was when the season ended. Damn right, because you're zero and zero and the Cardinals had the most disappointing season of any team last year. No, they were top five though. No, nothing will beat the Padres, Mets, and Yankees, but Cardinals were a disappointment. They were my pick to win the division. They didn't win, it was terrible. So they set out to redo their pitching staff. News alert, you don't win with quantity. You win with quality. You don't win a ring with depth and mediocre signs. You know this, St. Louis. When you were winning rings, you had aces. There is no ace in this bunch. They're fine. You bring in Sonny Gray as your number three, forget giving him $25 million because he's not worth that. Bring him in as your three. Gibson in as your swing guy. Lance Lynn is your swing guy. You're happy to release once he gives up home runs like he did last year, which he'll do again at Bush. 
then I'm in. But don't piss on my leg and tell me it's raining. St. Louis fans deserve better. They're smarter. They know more. You think you're convincing Cardinal fans that this rotation is a winning rotation, even in a division that likely will put the M in mediocre. That's sort of my problem with this signing of Sonny Gray and the combined signing of Gibson, Lynn, and Gray is that it's being misrepresented to you. It's like AI writing an article pretending it's somebody. These are people who are going to be pitching pretending that they are World Series quality. Good depth, bad for rings. So I'm sorry about that. I really am sorry to all St. Louis people. As a matter of fact, I have to do it, Coca. I'm doing a double wait to see today. Wait to see when I tell you something's going to happen. If it does, great. If it doesn't, fine. We'll revisit it. Unfortunately, the St. Louis Cardinals will not win one round in the playoffs next season. I'm sorry. Wait to see. You know what you don't have to wait for? And thank you for that question. And God, I love you, St. Louis. What name am I thinking of? Ah, you know. Nothing. Personal pick of the day. I am H-O triple T. Please tell me that you did that money line parlay with the Utah Jazz beating the Pelicans and the Sixers beating the Lakers. The Sixers beat the Lakers by 69 points. The Jazz eked out a two-point victory. But guess what? That was a plus 292 parlay. Hell yeah. Luckily, I didn't watch the Monday night game because you can't get those hours back. I told you to go under 44 and a half. We barely squeaked it out. We got so lucky at the end. They were about to go over and then they stopped the game after four quarters instead of playing 14 quarters. So we got very lucky, but we won the under. I'm sure that that was a very exciting game for Joe Buck and Troy Aikman. I think what they were thinking to themselves, God, am I rich. Thank God. Because calling these Drek games, it's a nightmare. Vikings, Bears, under 44 and a half. That was a win. All right, my pick tonight. Bucks minus three over the heat. But that's not the big story. The big story is, guess what? The in-season tournament, group stage, it ends today. And for the next two minutes, I shall be reading to you the exact scenarios for your team. If the Bucks win by more than 12 points and under 42 points, and the Heat lose by between six and eight points, while Brooklyn, Cleveland, and New York win by between or lose by more than 40 points, under 18 points, unless Giannis has 12 assists, 12 rebounds, and 11 points, in which case the Heat can lose by eight points. If the Knicks win by 13 points, then the Cavs get to go to Vegas. I have never seen a more ridiculous tiebreaker scenario than for the final day of the group stage of the in-season tournament of the NBA. As the teams get to play quarterfinals coming up in the knockout stage, and then they get to go to Vegas for December 7th and December 9th for the semis and the finals. And don't forget, the winner of this in-season tournament gets money accolades they get the love of their fans and their agents that's all folks that's all you get the final game it doesn't even count for the regular season it's like whatever stats you have nothing zero imagine playing a game and then it it's nothing it didn't even happen and you end your season or your career five points short of the next guy, you're like, I had those five points, darn it, dang it. I'm not trying to disparage the in-season tournament. I think it's sort of exciting. No, I don't. Enjoy, Bucks minus three over heat. All right, that's our show. We'll be back tomorrow. Me, live, Coca, live. No AI, just me. On the other hand, we'll see because Sometimes it's just business. This is nothing personal.